and welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast. I'm your host, Heather Tesco, and I'm a storyteller who makes history accessible because I believe it's a pathway to understanding who we are, our place in the universe, and being in touch with our own humanity. This is episode 71, and we're continuing to talk about France, specifically Henry VIII's relationship with France. But before I get started, a few reminders. First, please check out the Agora Podcast Network, of which this podcast is a proud member. Check out all the podcasts at agorapodcastnetwork.com. Also, you guys, we're coming up on 75 episodes here soon. This is episode 71, and then the next one is on the Field of Cloth of Gold, then two more episodes on France, which takes us to 75. And I want to do something super special for it. So I'm thinking about a Q&A Ask Me Anything session. So you can go ahead and send questions a while via Twitter at Tesco, T-E-Y-S-K-O, or the Facebook page, facebook.com slash Englandcast, or to my email, hello at heathertesco.com. Hello at heathertesco, T-E-Y-S-K-O dot com. You can ask me about anything, music, sports. I'm really into the Indian Premier League cricket, for example, motherhood, Spain, travel, whatever you'd like. I'm an open book. So start thinking about sending in those questions, and I will be recording the episode in a few more weeks. I would love it if you would ask questions about choral music. Be super cool. Also, remember I have another podcast, Watching the Tudors, where my husband and I watch the Tudors, him for the first time, and we talk about what was real, what wasn't, and I groan a lot at the Thomas Tallis storyline. I just... I just can't handle it. Check that out. It's all at englandcast.com. So now we're still on France and how Henry VIII felt about the country. A few episodes ago, when we started this series, I talked about Henry VII's foreign policy. And this episode, we're going to look at Henry VIII. Now, as usual, when we look at large themes and subjects like this, me talking for 20 to 30 minutes isn't going to cover it. This is meant to be an introduction, and then as we progress from time to time, we'll look at things again in more depth. It's important to remember that Henry's big aims when he became king, his big aims were to achieve fame, to be a great king, and to increase the status of England within Europe. Basically, he wanted to emulate Henry V, the famous warrior king who defeated the French at the famous Battle of Agincourt. England was coming out of the Wars of the Roses, out of this period of civil war and strife, and Henry really wanted to raise English eminence in Europe again, make England glorious again. And at this point, also, England had lost all the land that they had won in France, except for Calais. And so where his father, Henry VII, had tried to avoid foreign wars as much as possible, Henry jumped right into the European diplomacy scene. He married Catherine Varagon immediately after becoming king. That was kind of his first foreign policy move because that cemented his relationship with Spain against France. So at this point, there wasn't any question whose side he was on. Two years later, in 1511, he would join the Holy League with Venice and Spain, and that was set up to defend the papacy from France. So France was spending a lot of effort and energy during this period trying to win land in northern Italy that they had a claim to. And this would go on for the most of the 16th century, at least the first half of the 16th century. So Henry joins with his father-in-law in Spain and Italy to defend the Pope. He promised to invade France, and in 1512, he began landing his troops there. He had some initial struggles, and he was successful then in 1513 in the Battle of the Spurs. That became his first great glorious battle victory, and it was named the Battle of the Spurs because of the speed at which the French horsemen left the battlefield. Henry saw this as a glorious victory. It led to him capturing capturing Theron and Tournai. France was hoping that Scotland would distract England, since France and Scotland were longstanding allies. So it's important to also remember that this is also the period of the Battle of Flodden, which saw the death of over 10,000 Scots. It was the largest ever Anglo-Scottish battle. This is also the battle in which King King James IV was killed and three Scottish bishops. It was well and truly a rout, and the Scots would be unable to provide much of a threat for years. They now had a regency king, and they lost most of their nobles. It was really bad. 
At this point, the Holy League never actually fulfilled their promises to Henry, and so Henry wound up making peace with France on his own, and he married his sister, Mary, to the very old French king. This, of course, is the famous story of Mary asking Henry for permission to marry for love if the French king died. So at this point, Henry seems very clever. His sister is the regent of Scotland. She's, of course, the mother of James V. His other sister was married to the old French king. So if she had a son, and if he then died, she would likely be the regent of France. So things were looking pretty good for him. Plus, he was still allied with the Holy Roman Empire. Not a bad position to be in. But then, as usual, things turned sour for him. The French king died after just a few months, so there was no pregnancy with that. And then Mary married one of Henry's friends, Charles Brandon, without his permission. Of course, this is another kind of famous Tudor court story that there was this love affair and Mary married Charles Brandon. Plus, France now wanted to make war on Spain. So Henry's getting involved in this other foreign entanglement. And then his other sister, Margaret, in Scotland, made a really bad love choice. She married the Earl of Angus, and it looked like a really bad move because she had to leave Scotland altogether. When she remarried, she lost the regency of Scotland, and she had to leave altogether. It was during this period that Henry really started to build up his royal navy. Within the first six years of his reign, he built 18 new ships. And a couple of years ago, I did a few episodes on the growth of the Navy under Henry. So there's a lot more information on that particular subject with, I think there were like three or four different episodes I did on that. So I will add links to that in the show notes. Henry was really disappointed that his first kind of foray into France left him unable to recover the lands that he wanted. And he'd also been used clearly as this pawn by Ferdinand and the Emperor Maximilian in going to war with France, yet they didn't provide any help. And this would, you know, kind of be one of the early points in his declining relationship with his father-in-law. By the end of the 15 teens, Cardinal Wolsey, whose star was firmly ascendant by this point, he was becoming Henry's right-hand man, as we would know him then, he negotiated the Treaty of Universal Peace. On the episode we're going to do on the Field of Cloth of Gold, we'll talk a lot more about this particular treaty, but it was designed to enhance Henry's visibility and status in Europe through negotiating peace rather than war. So if they couldn't get glory through war, they would get glory through peace. All of the participating countries agreed not to invade each other and to defend each other if they were invaded. And in turn, this is a funny one, they agreed to let Henry broker any issues they were having with each other. So Henry became this great scene on or this great person on the European peace scene. Um, It was as part of this agreement that Henry and Francis, the new king of France, decided to meet each other. There was a Treaty Treaty of London that came out of that, and it was out of that that they decided to meet each other, and thus the Field of Cloth of Gold came to be. So the next episode, like I said, is an entire episode on the field, so I'm not going to go into too much detail about it here, but it is one of the most well-known of Henry's foreign policy activities. It was a two-week tournament in June 1520. It saw Henry and Francis in this great summit and tournament where they attempted to impress each other with each other's might and wealth. And it was cementing this peace agreement between the two of them. It was out of this agreement that Henry and Francis also decided to place a representative with each other's courts. And so the French embassy in London and the English embassy in Paris came to be. For the English, it was the first embassy established by a treaty, and it was the only permanent one of the entire 16th century. Of course, the peace agreement wouldn't last long, as these things seem to not last particularly long. But of course, at the time, nobody could have known that. And they went into it very open and you know committed to it. And the field was this culmination of this grand experiment of peace that was, was almost like a model United Nations 400 years early. Henry and Francis are famous now and remembered as being the two rival kings of the early 16th century in Europe. They were both similar in age. Francis was just a few years younger. They were both athletic, artistic, saw themselves as these Renaissance princes. And they were both really concerned about their standing in relation to the other. Henry and Francis would meet again in 1532, right about the time when Henry secretly married Anne Boleyn. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. So the middle part of Henry's reign was dominated by these attempts to leave his wife 
and eventually leaving the church. All of this left Henry very vulnerable as the other European powers saw an opportunity and an opening to invade England and impress the Pope. And of course, the Holy Roman Empire, Charles V, the Emperor Charles V was Catherine's nephew. So there was this constant fear that he was going to invade England to support his aunt in the divorce proceedings. Henry made a bet that Charles was too preoccupied with the threat of the Ottoman Turks on the eastern part of his empire to do too much with England. And for him, that was a sound bet that paid off. As the Reformation played out, France found itself in kind of a weird position in relation to England. The rivalry with Charles V was France's initial priority, was his first priority. Charles V and Francis were officially enemies. Um, during this time. And the spread of Protestantism throughout Europe meant that France was losing a large number of its allies, all the German states and all of these other allies that France had had were becoming Protestant now. So France conducted its foreign policy as if the Reformation had never actually happened. And this would be a main theme of their foreign policy in relation to religion for decades. Indeed, a century later, Cardinal Richelieu would say that the main kind of goal of French foreign policy was to defend and promote France's interests, regardless of anything else, including religion. France was supportive of Henry's desire for the Pope to annul his marriage and declare it invalid. And it was at that 1532 meeting when Francis welcomed Anne Boleyn as queen. He welcomed her with all of the honors and the splendor that she would have been expecting as a queen. And it was her first meeting with another dignitary, with another um, monarch as the queen representing England, even though she wasn't officially the queen yet. In October of 1533, Francis was supposed to sign a, a treaty with Pope Clement VII, which Francis hoped would include some settlement to Henry's problem. So he was offering to help by brokering some kind of agreement with this other treaty that he had, kind of piggybacking it. He wasn't doing it uh, out of pure friendship at all. He really wanted to create an alliance against the Habsburgs and the Holy Roman Empire. Henry ended this. He said he wanted to just deal with it himself. He was like, no, don't try to get in on that. I'm just going to figure it out my own way. Because he could tell that Francis's goals weren't to help him because they were such good buddies, but because he wanted to have this alliance against Charles and the Habsburgs. And Henry didn't want to become involved in a war between France and the empire. He really didn't want to necessarily be in Francis's debt to that. And he just wanted to kind of stay out of the whole situation. At the same time, he also had to be careful not to offend Francis. Henry could bet that he was safe from Charles, like I said, but France was a different matter. France was just across the channel And he really had to be careful that he wasn't going to offend him. When Francis began approaching Henry about another marriage contract between his son and Henry's daughter, Mary, Henry just pulled this really slick move in that he didn't respond at all. He just kind of ignored it. Like, what? You called? Oh, man, I I didn't see that. Shoot, I, I had my phone on silent. I just didn't get that message. Sorry. That was kind of his response. You know, he was trying to be diplomatic. In 1535, the Duke of Milan, Francesco Sforza, died, and Charles and Francis were again drawn into this Italian mess. They were focused on who should succeed the Duke. This meant that Henry had a bit of peace when it came to France, and he officially ordered all the English diplomats in France to pursue neutrality, but also to keep relations with France, quote, cold. He still had to be careful that he didn't push Francis into Charles's arms after the two had kind of concluded their dealings over the succession, though. Henry really feared an alliance between the two of them. And by 1538, it seemed like a distinct possibility when Charles and Francis both met with the Pope. So Charles and Francis got together with the Pope, and it really seemed as if all of the Catholic powers were uniting against the Protestant ones. And Henry seemed to be in a weak position against this league of Catholics that seemed to be forming. It was during this period when Henry's third wife, Jane Seymour, had died and Henry was on the marriage market again. He offered to marry several French princesses, but that never happened. He also negotiated marriage with the niece of Charles V, Christina of Denmark, but that also never happened. And in December of 1538, the Pope sent out an order that supported deposing Henry calling him, quote, the most cruel and abominable tyrant. 
This essentially meant that Henry and England were available to any Catholic prince who wanted to take them. So Henry wound up pursuing relationships with the Lutheran princes of northern Germany. They weren't powerful enough to have been able to fight off the Habsburgs if the empire was allied with France, but they were located in a strategic spot in Europe that would have made an invasion difficult, and it also was pretty much Henry's last best hope at this point. He kind of was cut off from the other major powers, so the Lutheran princes in northern Germany suddenly looked really appealing. In 1539, he married Anne of Cleves. We all know what happened with that. But it was at the same time that Francis had allowed Charles to march across France to put down a rebellion in Charles's land in Ghent. So it was really clear they were cooperating with each other. Francis was like, yeah, you can march across France with your army. That's totally cool. And Charles is like, I'm taking my army across France, which you wouldn't really think would be okay to have a foreign army marching across your land unless you're cooperating, right? So Henry started another period of naval buildup during this time. The French ambassador wrote in 1539 that were that there were 120 ships in the mouth of the Thames and 30 in Portsmouth. Remember that he only inherited about seven ships from Henry VII. So this was a huge building project that he had overtaken over the course of the last couple of decades. He also ordered the coastal defenses to be modernized and used the materials from the money and the money from the nearby dissolved monasteries. And again, in that series that I did on the Navy, I also talked about the kind of mini industrial revolution that was happening in the Weald of Sussex during this time. And that was to build cannon. Um, There was the new technology with furnaces happening at this time. So there was really a, a lot of movement on defense, on building cannon, on building defensive projects at this time. So definitely go back and listen to those episodes if you want to know more about this period of naval buildup and, and defense. Henry was lucky in the fact that Charles and Francis, like I said, were really clear enemies for most of the time. They were at war over their lands in Italy. They were constantly rivals, and Henry could more easily remove himself from the conflicts. Being an island, of course, helped to keep him physically apart from the conflicts. In 1539, Francis and Charles came to an agreement, but within two years it ended and they were back at war. In 1543, Henry allied with Charles and planned to attack France within two years. Henry particularly wanted to win back Bologna, and so he committed 5,000 troops, which sieged the city. In September 1544, Bologna surrendered to the English, and all seemed to be going well. He was riding high, but then, yet again, Charles screws Henry, and he makes his own peace with Francis. So it was kind of like a repeating record. What followed were several tough years for Henry leading up to his death. A French navy landed on the Isle of Wight, and there was the Battle of the Salent, where his famous ship, the Mary Rose, sank. The fleet that was set to invade England was actually larger than the Spanish Armada. It was a massive fleet that the French were going to send. But really, really luckily for Henry, Francis was distracted with the other stuff going on on the continent, and he sued for peace. Henry was granted Bologna for eight years, and Francis also agreed to pay Henry a pension for the rest of his life. And so that then takes us up to, you know, 1547 and Henry's death. So the themes of the relationships with France for Henry seems to have been this kind of on again, off again, trying to stay neutral, trying to stay removed from the European politics and wars, while also engaging where it's appropriate and really trying to avoid war as much as possible, except when you're trying to win back land that Henry V had won. Henry never captured the lands, one in Crecy and Agincourt, and as we'll see in the future episodes, more land would be lost in the coming decade. But that's for the future. So the book recommendation this week is Tudor Political Culture by Dale Hoke. Remember, you can get the show notes, the transcripts, all of this stuff like that by signing up for the newsletter on the site. And you can also get in touch with me through Twitter at Tesco or the listener support line, which you can text. It's 801-6-TESCO, 801-683-9756. That's also the best way to get in touch, or also through the Facebook page at facebook.com slash Englandcast. 
Thanks so much for listening, everybody. Remember the 75th episode Q&A stuff. So that's going to be fun. And the next episode is going to be The Field of Cloth of Gold. It's an interview with Glenn Richardson, who wrote a really comprehensive book on the subject. It's a really great interview. So stay tuned for that. And then we will move on to Henry's children. So I'll talk to you again very soon. Thank you so much. Blow northern wind, a sandful may be sweating. Blow northern wind, blow, blow, blow. Ich hoot a board in Bauerbricht, that soul is Sam Lee's on sea. Men's cool maiden of me, fair and fray to fonder. 